And it's hard. I think the world we live in, especially now with social media, it's you're always comparing and there's always going to be somebody that's doing better. And so it's really hard to just appreciate where you're at. Hey guys, it's Matt Haycox here and welcome to another episode of the Matt Haycox Show, where today I've got a guest who has done it all and she's going to tell you guys how you can do it all as well. You will probably know her as a record-breaking model. She's also an actress, a screenwriter, um, an interior designer, a recording artist, a video character, a TV presenter, an entrepreneur and a yoga instructor. So many, many, many things. Super excited to have you here. Welcome, Keely Hazel. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs> you, I actually literally have got a list that's half a page long of, of, of all, all, all the things that you've done. I've, I've missed I've missed off columnist as well and charity activist. So, uh, I mean, going back to your childhood, did you ever, I mean, were you a jack of all trades back then or did you have a particular passion? I mean, did you ever think, you know, 20, 30 years down the line, I'm going to be doing all these different things? No, I, I never thought I'd be doing so many things. Um, and also was somebody that didn't, kind of like the idea of doing many things but it just so happened that that's how it's gone um i mean as, as a kid did you like the idea of doing anything in particular i mean it, let's go back to your childhood i mean what you know what, what were you what were you like as a kid you know how, how did you block it out <laughs> <laughs> it's not a therapy session eh? <laughs> and then i was um yeah, I I mean, I was always very creative as a kid. So loved acting. Um, I performed a lot. I was very big into art. So I, I, I guess I did like a lot of things. And I, I used to pick up things and then drop them quite easily. So as a child, I'd really into playing the keyboard. And then all of a sudden, I would stop and move on to something else, which I think kind of translates slightly as an adult. I do get really intense on one thing for a, sh a period of time and then... If it doesn't stick, I sort of move on to something else. But but then if that thing does stick, do you then kind of go deep on go deep on that? Yeah, definitely. Like I think if it sticks, then I sort of go deep, or it, it takes me sort of in another direction. And I think my career very much has been I've pursued things that have become of interest and I have a passion towards, and then that leads me into something else and kind of all connect. I mean, do you think you would say it's been a, it's been a benefit to you, I guess, to your life and your career that, that you are that kind of trier and meddler? Because I mean, one thing I often get asked is, you know, um, I've got two career paths I want to go down or two businesses I want to start, you know, what what, what should I do? And, uh, and my advice, you know, to most people, because, you know, I mean, to anyone really even under 30, certainly the normal, the people who are asking yeah. these questions are under 25, under 20 i'm always saying like you know you're young enough to be trying everything uh you know you, you the perfect age to be making mistakes and and there's no you know there's no right answer you know you don't have to pick what course you want to do at school at this age you don't have to pick your career you know keep trying hobbies and and the only way you're going to find out what you're good at is to find out what you like and the only way yeah. to find out what you like is to find out what you don't like um so, so i mean I'm, I'm a massive advocate for you know for, for, for trying and meddling and um i mean do, do you think that's helped helped you get to yeah, definitely. Um, I also, a big thing for me is anything I'm sort of fearful of, I like to go towards. So in terms of trying stuff, if it's something that's potentially scary, then I like to go towards that and try it. But I definitely think you have to sort of try everything as, as much as you can. Um, and I know for me, there's been things I've always thought that I would sort of like, and then the actuality of it is is not you sort of do it and you're like actually this is not what i thought it would be um and then you kind of you've you've tried it and you can move on you don't have this like romantic idea of what it's going to be like like producing for me was something that i was like oh i feel like that would be interesting and then i was like oh yeah i don't know if it matches up to what i thought it would be what's the what's the scariest thing that you say like you're drawn to things that you fear I mean, what's the scariest thing that you think you've ever tackled or tried <sighs> The most recent thing that I did that was really scary was stand-up comedy. Oh, really? And it was something I don't think that I'm very good at, but I am very interested in the craft and I'm very interested in performing and I write. So for me, being able to like stand on stage and, and you know, perform and with something I've written is just great. Anyway, so stand-up, I was like, how can I write something that works? 
um, and it makes people laugh. And I got on stage and it was, it literally felt like I might wear myself. It was so <laughs> scary. But then afterwards, how did it feel afterwards? Though I mean, I mean, w w do you think you could have easily got back? I mean, did you only do it the once, or did you do it a, a second? And third I did time? it the once, and then I was intending to do it more times. I kind of wanted to keep going and see where it led, and if I could get better at it, um, and just to conquer the fear completely. But you know, kind of what happened? Lockdown happened, and sort of haven't been able to get out there and do it anymore. I'll tell you a few jokes later if you if you, yeah. you next time, don't worry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> as, as well as trying all these different things, I mean, what, what, what were your kind of character traits as a kid? You know, were, were you um, were, were you industrious, naughty? Uh, definitely naughty. Um, I'm trying to think, like, what else as a kid? Yeah, I, I mean, I was naughty. I didn't follow rules. Um, I'm very particular, um, which is a trait that is kind of good and bad sometimes as a kid I, I always reference this now as an adult because I like things to be exactly the way they are or I like to do something exactly the way I'd like to do it and as a child that would mean if we went to like an ice cream shop and they didn't have the flavor I wanted I'd be like well I, I just don't want anything um, which is great as an adult in terms of being you know in, if I'm doing interior or something actually having that quality is really good being precise in particular but as a kid it was very annoying grumpy and spoiled yeah, Grum yeah kind of. <laughs> <laughs> no. so um okay so let's let's talk let's talk about moving to you moving into your first I guess um ma mainstream role that that of a yeah. model and what, one of the things uh, I guess that you know everyone talks about nowadays is that there's no such thing as an overnight success and you know it's, it's, it's taken me 10 years 20 years to, be, to become an overnight success you've got to you know keep trying keep persevering but I, I, I guess I mean and we're also in an era when we're talking about with you of pre-social media um I mean you genuinely were the definition of of, of an overnight success back then I mean you know, you know, yeah. talk us talk us through it a bit you know what I mean what, what was it what was that feeling like what was the expectation I mean it was crazy and it yeah it doesn't really happen like that anymore sometimes I guess it does with you know if you end up on a tv show or if you go into reality and then you know your life could change if, but um for me I mean I was 18 um, and modelling just really kicked off straight away, which was kind of insane. You know, I grew up on a council estate in South East London, and then I ended up modelling, and, and literally within three months, I was on the front cover of my first magazine, and then the whole entire of the next year, I was on the front cover of every magazine, which was insane. Um, and it was it was crazy. It's really, I think for me, financially, was probably the biggest impact just you know going from not having any money and then all of a sudden you have money and you're like how is what do, what <laughs> and you usually can't afford things now what do I do um but in terms of and then I think yeah just your life changes but you get at that age it happens so quickly I think you're a little bit more malleable so you kind of and, and who, who was your kind of support network back then I mean I mean were you I was gonna, I was going to say were, were you ready for that overnight success but I mean I guess the the answer has to be no but yeah. but, but once once it had happened uh, I mean you know, how how did you adapt to, you know to, to the fame to the money you know did you spend it all were you reckless Are you um I I think I was quite smart with the money slight I think there's a little bit of recklessness that came in you know like I brought an expensive handbag um which you know has to be done you're like I have money now I can buy um but then I was you know the first thing I ever got like with my paycheck was a computer um and then had internet I had never had internet at home we didn't have a computer and I was 18 and everybody had AOL and MNS, MSN? MSN. MSN. MySpace. Yeah. <laughs> that <laughs> that MySpace. comes later. Like, yeah, that came later. Um, so that was the first thing. And then the th I think the third, the second thing was like a car and the third thing was an apartment. So I really was quite good. Um, but in terms of the fame... I mean, did you feel famous? Not really. I don't think I've ever really felt famous at all. Um, and I think the thing was with me is that I was so unrecognisable outside of modelling. I could I could walk along the street and nobody would know who I was. I could show up to a nightclub and people would know my name, but they wouldn't associate how I looked in real life with the image they saw sort of in the media. So it was quite 
for me, I kind of bypassed it a little bit. And, and, for, and for youngsters of today, I mean, I, I guess particularly in a climate where, th- where things like you know, m- mental health is, is so hi- um, uh, actively spoken yeah. about, I mean, w- would you would you advocate your life for the youngsters of today? I don't mean the whole life as in that, that point back then, you know, it, w- would you, what would you say to, you know, young kids nowadays, you know, seeking that, o- seeking that overnight fame? You know, w- would you advise it or, or, or would, you, would you give them some advice if, if they did have it? Yeah, I think... I think the pursuit of fame just for the sake of fame is kind of quite empty and you'd really have to, you know, dig deep and ask yourself why you're doing that. And at a young age, I don't think you have that retrospect and you can't really ask those questions. You see fame and you think that that sort of solves a lot of your problems or you'll have this notoriety and people are going to like you more and it's going to give you all of those things. And it really doesn't. I really don't think it's fulfilling. Um And so for me, I would say that you want to find something that fulfills you and fame, you know, I think is empty within itself. If you are famous because you're doing a job that fulfills you and it's a byproduct, I think that that could be a good thing or not necessarily a good thing. But um, I think it probably ties in with with the analogy with with money as well, that, you know, whether you're seeking fame, fame or fortune, if if you're doing it without... Uh, you know, without some backbone of um, of, of passion and interest and and, and support, etc., around you, then, then then ultimately, no matter how famous you are, no matter how rich you are, you, you're never you're never going to have any fulfilment. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think for me, that's you know, when I got to my early twenties, exactly how I felt. And I, I wrote something about this that I've never done anything with, and it was about my twenty first birthday party, and I had it at this private members club in London. I'd spent like an absolute fortune. And I was a successful model. And so in terms of like society standards, everybody was like, you know, you have fame, I had money. And I had all of these family friends that came to my birthday party and, and they were just like, you've done so well for yourself. Like, you must be so proud. Look at all you've achieved. And inside, I felt really empty and really alone, and really like, I don't feel fulfilled. This isn't, you know, which was a catalyst for me going off into different careers. But I think I got to that point and I was like, this is, you know, it's funny that everybody else around me thinks this is what success is. But yeah, it was so empty when I was there and, you know, having money's great. But if you're not really fulfilled and it gets to a certain point when, you know, if you've got enough money to survive, then, you know, you want to be doing something that's engaging and fulfilling. So. At that time, then, you know, were you feeling that you had a platform now, uh, you know, b- both, I guess, in terms of fame and money that, that could now allow you to expand into other things? Or did you just kind of wake up one day hating modelling and walk away and then go and find other things to do? Or, or, or was there a bit more of a, an active plan? It was a bit of a process. I realised, I think, when I was like, t- it was 20 to 21. And I'd only modelled for a couple of years, but I knew that it, you know, I was sort of unhappy with some life choices and what I was doing. And I wanted to go into a different career, but I just didn't quite know what that was. Um, And so it took a while. It took like a good couple of months of like figuring out, you know, how do I move on from this? What do I do from this? And I had some financial stability. And then, you know, I kind of went around the options and, and did... And I, I was in, I mean, I've been in therapy for a really, really long time, but from then, and my therapist would make me write out all of these things that I really enjoyed. And acting was the one that kept coming up as number one. But in terms of my career path then, having modelled, there wasn't really anybody that made the transition in a way that I enjoyed or wanted to do. But I kept coming back to it. And I was like, I don't think it's right. I don't know if I'm going to be successful. Like, this is going to be really difficult to make the move. But then I was like, oh, it's the scariest option and I think I should do it. And so then I kind of made the moves to transition for modelling and, and quit, which was really scary. And how, I mean, how long did that take for you? I mean, did you kind of make the decision and just stop taking jobs the next day or...? Yeah, I, I made this decision and then I'd, I'd kind of slowly stopped taking jobs. And so I was contracted to um, some, some magazines and I'd stopped working for them. And the only uh, publication I was working for then I guess was the sun or any other kind of yeah I just kind of stopped saying yes to jobs and then I 
when I moved to LA and as soon as I got to LA, I was like, yeah, I'm not going to work anymore. And that was it. And were you, were you getting kind of... Were terrified. You getting, <laughs> now I'm thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, were you getting pressure from, I mean, I presume obviously your, your, your management are going gonna, are gonna to be earning almost, almost as nicely yeah. as you. You're going to have friends and family that say, Keely, you're fucking nuts. You know, you're, 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 you're at the top of your game here. I mean, was there a lot of, a lot of pressure and people trying to keep you back? Yeah, I mean, I think... <laughs> You know, management and everybody thought, you know, I'd probably go to LA and I'd come back and then I'd want to work again because, you know, fight, like I was earning a really good amount of money and just walking away from that at the time is kind of crazy, really. And and so they kind of, I think, gave me a little bit of space thinking I would come back and then I just didn't. Um, but nobody really said what you're doing is... Uh, and going back, you asked me earlier whether I had sort of a support group and no hadn't really been like from a young age that big of a network for me you know I don't come from a family that is anyway you know the working class my mum works in Sainsbury's my dad's a window fitter so nobody was used to this world I'd ended up in they didn't know anything about how to manage being you know a model and, and finances and stuff like that and so I think they just were like oh she does what she does now and you know she makes her own money and I think See what a, it, it, it's it's a kind of a a big lesson or a kind of you know, inspiring lesson. I think you know, for, for for a lot of the guys listening or watching to this as well, because you know, I always find so many people uh, find it so difficult and find so many excuses not to make not to make the step from doing something that they don't like into something that they yeah. know they will like. But you know, but we're talking about people there who uh, you know are pro probably not earning significant sums of money that they're actually walking away from into. In, in, into something blind you know that the, the, the financial mm -hmm. impact between the two things you know may sometimes be negligible or may certainly be be recoverable uh, you know if, if they find that they haven't found the way it way in a couple of months time and I guess you know you, you and people might look and say oh well you know she had loads of money anyway but you know that if it didn't work out for you and you knew stuff that money's going to run out at yeah, some yeah. point so I think I think you know I guess it's you know an inspiring lesson for the guys at home that if you can make that if you can make that leap to walk away you know when you're at the top of your game especially at such a young age as well uh, yeah. Yeah. That uh, you know, that, you know, guys at home really need to really need to think hard about not uh, you know not following their dreams and not uh, and, and not doing what's what's true to them. Yeah, yeah. I think it's you don't want to look back and think I wish I'd done. And for me, it was like I didn't want to look back and think oh, I wish I'd done that. Um, so I think you do. You just you sometimes have to make the jump, but it is hard. I think it's hard when you're in a secure job. And then you don't know with so much job uncertainty, like in the current climate, you just, it's scary to leave something. But ultimately, I think in terms of your experience in life, you need to just do it. And if it doesn't work out, something else and once, hopefully it, will. And once you've made the decision, obviously it's a scary decision for you to make. You've made it, you wake up the next day, or you're, you're, you're in England or you're in LA. Yeah. I mean, do, are you waking up scared every day at that point thinking, fuck, what have I done? Have I made the right decision here? Or are you, look, I've bitten the bullet, I'm on with it, you know, what will be, will be? I think I had moments of um, both. And so when I moved to LA, it was very new and I was going to school and studying acting. Um, and so I didn't, I was kind of just moved on and, you know, this is a decision I'd made. And then there was moments like financially, like I had a really big tax bill because I'd, you know, pay your tax a year later. And that came you and I was You handbags like, to buy, you can't be paying tax. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so I had this huge tax bill and at that point it, it took a lot of money from me. And I was like, oh God, have I made, how am I going to now, you know, what have I done? So there was moments of that where I panicked and especially coming from a career such as modelling, it was like it gets to a certain point where you just can't go back. You know, I couldn't now want to restart a modelling career. It doesn't exist anymore. That industry isn't there. So there was that fear that would creep in at certain times. And, you know, I guess sometimes even now there's elements where I go, oh, was that the right decision? Um, should I have just pursued what I was doing and, you know, had the financial success even more so than I did? But then I come back to know I wasn't happy. And I, was I mean, I was going to say what I mean, I, I kind of ask you now while it while it's still on the tips of our tongue, but I guess it's probably more a question question at the end. But while you say, I mean, what is the answer? I mean, do, do, do you do you really think you've made the right decision or do you think you should have given it another year or two? Or? 
Yeah, I mean, you, I think you have to believe you've made the right decision because otherwise you're just going to be in a perpetual state of regret and like self-loathing. And I do think I have made the right decision for me. Um, I do think there's elements of fear that come in now, you know, I've, I've been successful in a few things and but there are times, you know, like this year, it's fearful for everybody. There's not really much work happening. And then you're like, oh, did I make the right decisions in life? Like now what happens and being self-employed and then not knowing when there's always that element, I think, just of being on un underlining level of like, was that the right choice? But I do believe it was. And I know we'll probably always keep going back to the point of uh, I wasn't I wasn't happy. So it, so it, it doesn't matter what the answers are. But you, so yeah. you, you go to LA, you're you're in acting school, you take you're taking acting acting auditions, and and, and pr presumably lo losing m more auditions than, than than you would win. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, I mean, I mean, what what did that feel like to you? Given that when you've left England, you've probably got every magazine you know, begging you to to have photos, and you you knocking everyone else back, and now it's the other way around, and you and you're getting knocked back probably nine times out of ten, as as as, as everybody is. I mean, yeah. is that you know, not talking about did you or not did you or didn't you make the right decision? But just you know, but just from a, an emotional perspective and a, and, a, and, a, and a you know sanity perspective. I mean, was that was that tough as someone who who'd been able to you know I guess have the the publishes at a feat. Yeah, um, it's an interesting question. Actually, no one's ever really. Ooh, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> said that. Um, yeah, it's difficult dealing with rejection. I think just anybody in acting, especially, is just a career where you just have it so much. You're just it's constant rejection. Um, and coming from a career where everything was sort of open and and it happened really quickly. Um, I think for me, it was the hardest thing was the emotional feelings of like with modeling, I didn't want it. It sort of happened. And so when the doors were open, the jobs came in, it wasn't something that I was like, oh, I really want to be on this front cover. It was just there. It was with the acting, I really wanted it. And then I wouldn't get it. And so it had this weird sort of element where I almost thought, if you don't want something, does it appear more for you? Do you end up? getting something when you're not as emotionally charged and attached to it, um, which I do think is slightly true. And then I had to bring that in to sort of acting and let go a little bit and, you know, just kind of not want it as much. And then I started working. Um, but it is hard, I think, going having so much rejection when everything's been quite easy. And did you find that that, that rejection was primarily just because that's, a, that's the nature of the game? There's always so many people who, who, who want, uh, you know, the only one job. Or, or, do, or yeah. do you think at the time you, you, your past was hampering you as well? There definitely was the element of the past that came in, which I always sort of knew. Um, and it was kind of a double-edged sword because the past in America, having some sort of name opened doors that then once I got in those doors it was then the past that kind of closed them so it was this really weird place of you know I have got these opportunities but then my past would be like and it when it comes down to hiring somebody if you're looking at two actresses and then you have somebody that's online you know topless in a lot of photos versus somebody that isn't they tend to go with you know it's an easier hire to have somebody that doesn't have sort of the past I do. So that did, that was a factor in it. So let's, let's I guess, fast forward from, from, from acting to, to now. What, 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 other, what other things have ha happened along the way? Well, obviously in the introduction, you know, we, we, we talked about, uh, about screenwriting and interior design and all, the, all, yeah. all these other things. Have these, have these been, uh, let's say, passion projects along the way that uh, have been things you've tested and then fallen by the wayside or have, have, have any of these you know, stayed the course with you to today? Yeah. Um... Writing, you know, is a very weird one that came about because I'm dyslexic, you know, I didn't finish school, like, I was about to say high school, I'm so American. Um, I, I mean, I have one GCSE, so... What is it? Math. Oh, really? Yeah. What, what grade? A C. So it's not even really that good. That's it. <laughs> it's still a pass. I got one pass, <laughs> like, all of my... Did you not take the others, or did you...? Um, I only took five. Okay. 
I took five. I don't, I think I got kicked out of the rest. <laughs> so I took five. No, one out of five. But I also took the tests where you couldn't get past. I think the highest I could get was a C. I think of the way that it oh, worked. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, so you, you get setted before then, don't you? You get set before and mine were all really, really bad. <laughs> I mean, was that, I mean, I guess as, talking about the dyslexia as a kid, was that something that you, that you kind of noticed at the time that, that you know, did, did it annoy you or did it, you know, cause you embarrassment or grief with other people? How has that stuck with you along, along your career? Um, yeah, I, th I mean, I don't really, rem I remember having to have loads of tests as a kid and then when I had exams, somebody had to read them to me. Um, and I don't, it's, I think for me, because I was dyslexic, it then forced me, like as an adult, to read more and to write and to kind of overcome it. Um, and how does it impact you when you write it? As, as in, you know, does it does it just make it, I mean, I, I, obviously I know what dyslexia is. I mean, I don't understand the ins and outs of it medically, but I mean, do, does it yeah. slow you down with your writing? Does it, does it, does it mean you kind of write words backwards, but you, you you still understand it, but other people don't? Yeah, I don't know if it's really so present with, I think for me, what tends to happen is um, I replace words. So, and I always laugh about this one because I always replace coming with going. For so <laughs> well, <laughs> that could be awkward. <laughs> 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 um, so like I'll end up I'll write and then you know when I reread I'm like <laughs> just I put in completely I don't know I don't even know how it happens in my brain but um, and I do think it, it just for me anything that I tend to not be good at it's going towards like it's kind of going back to that fear thing if I'm not good at something or I'm fearful of it I go towards it and so with being dyslexic I think it forced me more in to read and then to write but only as an adult not as a kid as a kid i don't really I don't really remember actually too much of it but <laughs> so obviously i mean you know talking you you've, there's so many different you know things that you're passionate about and, th and, and the different yeah. passions that you've tried uh, i mean as we were saying at the, at the beginning of this and off camera you know a, a lot of my audience are people who you know would love the chance to turn their passion into in, into a career uh, or would certainly like to live a more fulfilled life by you know by doing more more of, of the things that they love uh, i mean you know, what, what would your kind of top three tips to people out there be you know who who want to you know want to follow a passion who want to you know be more fulfilled yeah. Um, tips. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I guess, I mean, first of all, you have to find your passion and what that is. And that I think is a journey within itself. And for me has been one of the biggest ones, and, you know, seeking what is my passion, because there has been so many things I'm interested in. And that's what you do when you say there has been, do you still Passion seeker. I mean, are you, are you still always trying new things? You know, you, 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 the, we could hear about a completely different direction for you in a couple of years' time. Yeah, I think now I've tried a lot of things. Um, but, you know, there's always like the element of, in terms of career, what is for me, because it's, there's been a few pursuits. And so what then becomes the main focus and do I then just rear in one direction and that becomes my full time kind of focus on others um but there's still stuff now i mean i've been i've always been obsessed with photography and i pick it up all the time and then i get really into it and then i put it down and then i have these romantic ideas of wanting to be a photographer and and then i realize i don't because i don't actually know how to use a camera i only just know what i like in terms of um photography so i think it is, you can have a... But, you know, I'm going to interrupt you, I'm sorry. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, right. I think, but I think that's, that, that's, that's really interesting. It's, it's something that, you know, I, I talk about with, you know, with quite, quite a few guests and so in general that, you know, you say, oh, I don't know how to use a camera, I only know what I like. And I think, you know, far too often people think, well, I don't want to follow that road because I like it, but nobody else does. But 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 in, to, yeah. in today's world, you know, particularly the world of internet, the world of social media, that you, you've you've got access to the entire world, and yes. there are some other people out there. That, well, well sorry, some, there's going to be. You, you may think you're the only one in that niche, but there will be. I'm not saying there's enough people to make you hundreds of millions of pounds, but there's always enough people in whatever niche you're in to get a thousand fans, 10,000 fans, you know, 50,000 yeah. 50, know, fans, customers, call them what you want in that. I think, I think it's important that, you know, people don't let that put them off, yes. uh, you know, off, off wanting to go forward, you know, <laughs> back with the theme of try many things, you know, try it, see how many people out there, you know, do, do like yeah. those funny pictures yeah. you want to take. 
Yeah, no, that was funny. <laughs> um, and I think the biggest thing, actually, going back to tips, is is find, once you find that passion, and this for me is one, you know, we've kind of touched upon it, is um, commit. I think you have to commit wholeheartedly to whatever it is you find then is your passion and you have to just go for it. And there's going to be times where I, it gets tough and that's like, you know, the photography thing for me, it's not enough of a passion, but sometimes I pick it up. And if it really was, I could stick through the hard times of it, which there's inevitably going to be. If it's writing, there's going to be times when you're banging your head against the wall or, you know, acting, you're mainly going to just be doing that. Um, but you just really, I think, commit to something, you know, which is a slogan for a gym. To <laughs> <laughs> commit to something. Commit. <laughs> commit Presumably the gym. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the gym. Commit to the exercise. Commit to the exercise, yeah. But I think that's important. And whether it is you're going to try a few things, you just have to commit to them and see it through. And and so what I mean what drives you what you know what gives you your commitment what what motivates you you know I guess in the past and, and now you know what, what how do you get up in the morning? For me, like career wise, it's anything that challenges me. So I have to be mentally challenged in some sort of way. And so you know, interior was something I took on recently, and I refurbished an entire apartment, something I've never done, didn't know anything about, and had to really start from scratch. But just I'm very into aesthetics and also, you know, just like learning something new for, for me gets me up in the morning. I want to know everything about it and just that challenge of doing something that I don't know how to do. So that's what gets me cool. going. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Being challenged. <laughs> the fear, the challenge. The fear and the challenge. <laughs> Com commit to the fear and the challenge. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, 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 when, and so the when gym. We're, <laughs> and the gym. <laughs> Sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> so, so when we did some re research for this uh, this interview, uh, one of the things that came up was you know something you said in the past about how you you know you often feel insecure and and you kind of often compare yourself to other people and think about you know where you think you should have been you know what, what, rather than where you actually are. Uh, yeah. I mean, is, is is that something that is, is still with you? You know, do, do you do you feel more like you've made it now? Or? Yeah, uh, no, definitely not. I have this conversation with friends of mine all the time. I think being a woman in your th in my thirties now, and, and my friends are all in their thirties, and there's just this expectation. I think where you assume you're going to be, and for me, career-wise, I still don't feel like I've hit. You know, and I'm very fortunate when I look back. I'm like. I have done a lot of stuff and so there's gratitude there, but I always feel like I haven't hit my stride or, you know, I um, don't have children yet. So there's like other elements where, I don't know, I think that that's always present. And it's hard. I think the world we live in, especially now with social media, it's you're always comparing and there's always going to be somebody that's doing better. And so it's really hard to just appreciate where you're at. Uh, how you how do. different do you think your career would have been, which is uh, social media, if social media had, had have been around, you know, back, back in the day that you started modelling? Yeah. I wonder, I often think about that. I think, I guess there is a career there now, like the modelling career is now being an imp. In, yeah. an influencer or an Instagram model um, but it, the only like positive thing I think if it had been around then was that social media gives you a platform to have your own voice and when I modelled I was so voiceless and so you know I did an interview and somebody else wrote it up and published it and oftentimes things would be changed so you didn't and there was no outlet to speak directly to fans or give them you know for them to see me outside of this photo shoot. It's like, this yeah. is the image that everybody sees and then who I am at home or these other things that you can now see through social media of somebody you just didn't have. I guess I guess it's uh, it's pros and cons and everything. I'm just you know, yeah. thinking about it myself while, while, while you're saying it then. And I guess you're whilst on the one side, you would have had the social media to have your own voice and to be an influencer. I guess you know w w one of the reasons you were so successful was because th there wasn't all these other distribution channels. Um, yeah. You know, th th there wasn't social media where you know ev not everyone, but you know, let's say m m models can put their own pictures up. You know, p people can get you know get famous off the back of reality TV. I mean, it was a, it was a very 
narrow distribution. You know, a very small number of people doing it, and I, I guess you, you you got to be you got to be king of that castle. Yeah. Whereas if if there was much more availability of content, uh, you, yeah. you, you'd have you'd have been heavily diluted. I guess. Yeah. You? So you got to. I guess it, it cuts both ways. <laughs> yeah, it's also interesting that now with social media it's all you know you have to do it yourself so it's self-promotion in a way whereas for me i don't know if i'd have felt confident enough at 18 to put myself out there like that i i won a competition and then everything sort of happened and people booked me and that gave me some sort of validation because somebody else had seen my potential versus me i don't think i would have been able to just you have that confidence in myself completely so we live in a society of of reality TV, of social media, reality stars, etc. Uh, and I guess whilst they that concept wasn't particularly around when you were modelling and when you were famous, you know, there's, there's still that perception of of you know, Keely the character or what's the what's the real Keely. I mean, did you ever did you ever feel pressure to kind of be who people thought you really were, or you know, or did you ever find yourself morphing into that character? I think I felt there was a lot of pressure to be more of that character. And so like for me, like I'm somebody um, that dresses quite conservatively just through style choice and management were always like, you know, when you go out, you should look a certain way or you need to play into this character more. You need to be that person who they think you are. And that would always I kind of always felt a little bit upset by it because I was like, am I not good enough? Like, is me the person? Um, but then there was also like this confusion that came generally. Like, and I remember at one point um, meeting this guy and he had this idea of like who I was and what I'd be into and how I just based on sort of magazines. And that was very much a lot of people. You'd be like, this is who you are. So this person is character you play. No, that's you. And I'd be like, but it's not. I'm, you know, I'm going through hair and makeup and made to look like somebody that really doesn't look like me in real life. Or I don't, you know, I just don't kind of dress like that. That's not kind of the person who I am. And, and that would be kind of a little bit of a mind fuck for people too because they were like how are you they couldn't quite understand it was a character which i think people now are i've just heard there's a documentary about paris hilton that's come out and she i watched it i watched it the oh, weekend did? actually I did, yeah yeah and that's her talking about how she was always this character and she had to sort of play that and i think that now we're kind of you know that's being cut into and people are understanding that it is and with reality tv people are they do play up to these characters but they are sort of different um but i've kind of i think i in real life definitely shied away from being the character because it was not something i wanted sure I just wanted to be myself <laughs> did, you, did you ever find occasions when you were kind of taking advantage of having having that character you know a, you know, maybe on a night out when you wanted to put your guard up or or i guess if you find, find a reason to be the keely that everyone expected you to be um he, yes and no. I mean, I guess it's it's nice when you have a character or you're, you know, sort of pretending to be something that's kind of not who you are. It's easier. Like as an actor now, it's easier to play someone else. If I go out and I'm, you know, pretend to be someone, then you kind of takes away from yourself. Um, but I also think it's kind of hard as well at a young age because you're still you know, you're still trying to figure out, like for me, it was a big part of figuring out who I actually was. And then having this character thrown at me and being told this is who I should be, I guess is kind of, kind of became a protection in a weird way. So, I mean, and you've, had, you've had a hell of a journey, you know, so, so many experiences, you know, so, so many diff different things you've learnt. I mean, is, is there anything in particular that you know now that, that you, wish, you wish you'd learnt earlier? You know, so, so, something that, you know, I don't know if you, if you knew this when, when you'd started your modelling or when you'd started your acting that, uh, you, that, that you think could have changed your thoughts or your trajectory? Yeah, I mean, so many things. I think that's always like, you know, you get older, you're like, if I, you know, if I all knew this. Um, I mean, I think the biggest thing is that time goes by really quickly. And so when you're young, just, you know, I think that is the time when you should be trying everything. You should just be having fun and living life to the full because 
it just really does pass. Like my twenties went by so quickly and I was like, how, what happened? How am I in my thirties? And what has that gone on? It only gets quicker, believe me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. I mean, I, I am only in my thirties, by the way. I just got <laughs> throw that in there, but <laughs> it doesn't get any better. Yeah. Who is it? There's a, a comedian that has the thing that every year it's like, it's when you're younger, it's like happy birthday to you. And then all of a sudden as you get older, it's like happy birthday. It's just like all of a sudden your birthday, <laughs> get it, Christmas, get it out of the way. just come around so quickly. And when you're younger, it seems like it's so slow and it takes so long, but. Oh, oh, you get me, you, you get me, you get me worried and thinking about, thinking about birthdays now. <laughs> I've got one coming up. <laughs> I just had one. Oh really? Yeah. Like a few, five days ago. Um, I'm t two, two and a half months away. Christmas day. Christmas yeah, day. Christmas baby. You can mark it in your diary. How do you feel again. about that? Do you get? So when, so when I was a kid, I was, uh, I, feel, I feel like Oliver Twist saying this. <laughs> I was, um, as a kid, I, it was Christmas in the morning and birthday in the afternoon. And, and, when, and when you're little, everybody likes you, don't they? So I had presents, uh, presents for Christmas in the morning, presents for uh, my birthday in the afternoon. And it yeah. was like really made special. I'd probably hit 12 or 13 and it kind of consolidated a bit more. You know, you, you get like a, a it, it, it'd still be Christmas and birthday in the, in the two different times, but people would probably get me like one present. Yeah, maybe it was a bigger present, but uh, yeah. uh, then I got to like 15, 16 and it was a smaller present. 17, 18, it was no, it was no present in a card. A fucking <laughs> no, <laughs> fast forward 25 you. years. I get a, I get a card, and as long as I give my daughter some money, she buys me a present. <laughs> and if, if, I, yeah, if yeah. I want something, I'm going to get it for myself. <laughs> I don't want to depress you about what's to come or anything. Yeah. <laughs> no, I've already realised on my last birthday when I got like one card through, and I was like, oh, I remember like just they slowly dwindle off. It was like my twenties, so like teens you just get so many in gifts and then all of a sudden they just stop coming and now just i had one birthday card <laughs> well I've got, I've got father's day now so i do get one one, oh, yeah. one extra nice. opportunity for um for, for a present so yeah. all, although this father's day uh she said i've got i've got three things for you and she turns up and gives me two uh says oh, i'm not trying to be greedy but you said the three things <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. and she says oh it's not arrived yet i think it was father's day back in june every weekend i say to her Where's that? Where's that thing? Oh, it's not come yet. <laughs> are, you, are you sure? <laughs> yeah. so. Next Father's Day, you'll get it. Here's that thing. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's out of date. Out yeah, of date yeah. sweets. <laughs> Socks that don't fit. <laughs> so, so tell me. Uh, I mean, obviously, for, for, all, for all these different uh, activities that you've been trying, uh, and all, all the ones you do. I mean, what's what's your approach uh, approach to learning? You know, I mean, do, do you? Because I, I, again, in, in research, I've, I've read you, you've done a, an, an online. Um, I think you did, did an online course, online university type thing, yeah. on, online learning. I mean, do, do you kind of, you know, go feet first with that kind of attitude? You know, are, are you, uh, you know, are you methodically planned? Do you just, like, you, do you hire a coach? Have you got mentors? I think it depends what it is. So, you know, let's, let's pick one. <laughs> um, like whether it's writing or like interior, maybe let's, let's do interior. Okay, let's interior. Talk about pink interior. Okay, so yeah, pink interior. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did paint all pink. Um, my little sister actually had her entire room pink, pink carpet, pink walls. You'd, you'd have loved it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, was it neon? It was pretty neon. Okay. I'd say it's pretty yeah. neon. Um, <laughs> so interior. So the approach to that, I have. Um, two friends that are interior designers, well, actually I have more than two that are interior designers, and one of them worked for a very big interior designer in LA. Um, and so I kind of had them as mentors in terms of helping me in the journey of like, how do I do stuff? So if I, in, I had this project, I knew I wanted to refurb this two bed, two bath apartment. Um, was it your apartment? It was it? my apartment that I'd owned since I was, 19 it was the third thing i brought um and it's this warehouse and i knew that i wanted to redo it because when i brought it it'd been done really you know somebody had just come in and like shoved in a kitchen and it was done really badly it had such good features so it had so much potential it was like i really as a project want to redo this because i have a vision of how it should look and so in that i then went to my friends or interior designers and asked them you know how do i start in this project um i'd also done a course so i went to ucla in la and did a course in interior design had them as mentors which was fantastic that i had that access to two people that do it professionally and then just like read anything i could um you know sort of 
and then learnt or along the way kind of thing. Um, there is so much information, like you said, like now out there. And if you do, you know, the course for me was really good because it takes you, you know, going on a course, you kind of get books and and literature that you wouldn't necessarily pick up because it's not sort of on show, it's textbooks, like interior design textbooks. So I went through all of those and learned about a bunch of stuff and then, and then just went in and did it and made mistakes and, and now kind of have a better view and, of it. And you just learn so much in the process. Have you done some more jobs since then? Are we going to see more of you interior designing? Um, I haven't done any since just because <laughs> I haven't been able to do any. I haven't done anything. Um, but yes, there is one. I did a little sort of job before this um, in LA, but I think potentially, yeah, I'd like to. I'd like to do another project and redo the whole place. So other than that, and once you're allowed out and you don't have to wear a mask, what, what, what's yeah. the, um, what, what, what does the future hold? <sighs> Who knows? It's scary out there. Um, yeah, I think, you know, pursuing a lot of the stuff that I've been pursuing, I shot a TV show last year and that's going back for a second season. So that will film potentially sometime soon. Um, and then interior stuff, like looking for sort of a project, is sort of next on the agenda. Um, and then see. Well, I'm locking a bedroom into a study. A little bit of pink. I'll give you, I'll give you okay, a whirl. Okay, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll find some good pinks for you. So you don't sound very excited about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. Love it. Love paint colours. <laughs> Get really into it. Really nerdy. And now to a point where I can like sometimes set, know what a paint colour is. Be like, I know what one that is. That's, that's a pharaoh and bull uh, pigeon right there. We, we, we need like to that. find the perfect pink pantone. <laughs> okay. Well, that's, okay, that's your I'll mission. go through. All right. I'm going to call you tomorrow. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put out a whole slew of colours. Um, yeah, so I think that's it. And then writing something I'm always doing daily and we'll we'll see. So by your own admission, you've uh, you've had, uh, let's say, um, a uh, not not your not your best years uh, dur during school, during high school. You know, you you, you suffered from dyslexia. You, you know, you you left school early, but then you've kind of had a complete U-turn and further down the line, then then gone you know, back to school, not just once but twice, and you know, and, and to two, two of the world's most, I guess, you know, re renowned uh, institutions for the things that you were learning. I mean, how how did that feel for you? You know, I mean, particularly on that first day, you know, s s sitting down in class class meeting other students you know I mean the, the last time you were in four walls like that you know you were misbehaving in Bromley <laughs> yeah very true um <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's funny I think by nature I'm somebody that enjoys education and I'm very curious that is one of my traits and has led me to a lot of things and so it's kind of I think with secondary school you know I hated I just detested being there I, but I think partly because I wasn't doing something I enjoyed. So for me, the idea of being in a class with a lesson that I have no interest in is just, you know, I'm a, I f just switch off. I don't want to be there. But I also think I just didn't have, you know, I kind of fell through the cracks in school. There's a lot of kids, you know, there wasn't anybody guiding me and giving me the sort of support I needed or, or helping me. And I just didn't have the active interest. But as an adult, you know, I'd love learning and I, you know, so getting back into a classroom, I, I remember when I was 18 was actually the first time I went back in and, and did like a an adult course, I don't even like in law, which was really intense. Um, but yeah, it, it's, I think it also it's under your own rules. As an adult, when you go in and you learn, you are deciding, whereas in school, somebody's forcing you to be there and it just wasn't it wasn't right for me at all. But I guess, and I'm com completely with you on that about obviously, you know, f f wanting to learn and wanting to learn the things that you want to learn about. Um, but, and, and I know that obviously back at school, you will probably never have learnt the things that you want to learn now. But now you're more into education and I guess you're now, now you're more passionate or, or sensible about it. Do, do, you, do you actually re regret leaving school early or, or regret not putting more effort in then? Or do you think it just is what it is? And it's yeah, not I mean... I wish I had put in more effort at school. Like I wish I'd done better. And and I wasn't someone that did really terribly. I could, like when I first started school, I, I came in and I got put into a lot of the top sets. And and then I realized that all of the kids I wanted to hang out with weren't there and, and 
And so I kind of, you know, was naughty <laughs> and then got chucked down. And everybody also thought, why is she here? Um, but yeah, I don't, I mean, I've forgotten even what I was answering. Oh, cheers, cheers. <laughs> <laughs> I thought what I was saying. I so said, I'm just now remembering being back in school. So. <laughs> no, I, I, I said that, do, do, you, do you wish you'd taken education more yeah. seriously when you, when, when you were younger? Do you, do you wish you'd put more effort in at school, yeah. even though it wasn't particularly the subjects that you may have wanted to do? I definitely wish that I had. I think, you know, when I think back, I wish I'd taken school seriously, um, just because I think it sets you up so much in life. And I was so fortunate that I ended up in a career that, you know, didn't, I didn't need GCSEs or A-levels to do, um, which is funny. I do remember when I was in art and I wasn't paying attention in the teacher, and I've said this in a few interviews, um, was like, if you don't take school seriously, what are you going to do? And I was like, I'm just going to be a page three model. <laughs> and then it actually came true. Yeah, premonition, be <laughs> careful what you wish for. Exactly. Um, <laughs> But I do. I think anybody like young, it's hard because they think at that age you just don't. You don't want to. I mean, I have this. De I have this debate with uh, or, or d debate slash pressured argument with Harley, my daughter, all the time to say, you know to say things like you know <laughs> pick an instrument like like, like I would say like learn the piano I mean she used to tinker with the piano a bit and, and, and I do so obviously it's, that's my personal choice but I say if you don't want the piano don't do the piano but yeah. pick, pick, pick another instrument or you know pick, pick a, do a sport again like a tennis suits me but if you don't want to do tennis pick another one because all these things you, you'll regret not having them you know when, when you it just sounds boring and look you know obviously I was there at your age having this conversation with my, da my dad as he was with his dad yeah. and, and, and on and on I, I try and say she probably just looks at me like a sad old bastard I always go come on I'm I'm hardly a boring dad, right? So be believe me when I say you're going to regret at 25 years old, like not being able to walk into a party and kick ass on the piano or or, 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 or get invited to something and be able to pick up a tennis racket or whatever, whatever it is. But I guess, you know, she, she has her her passion. Speaking of language, that's always something I think we, we, we always regret when we're older. You know, when we're at school, yeah. you never want to be in French class or Spanish or German or whatever. But, you know, how cool would it be at 30 you, odd to, yeah. be, to be able to, you look at people who can converse in four or five, different languages simultaneously and uh, but but then you know by the time you you know you get to our age it's kind of it's kind of too late to learn yeah yeah I totally agree I had that conversation the other day about language because you're like you just don't in school and I think it's also you do le pick up a lot of things you learn really quickly at a young age so so much for me now as an adult I'm always like I wish I'd you know started young if I'd done that you know, when I was eight or something, now, you know, you'd be a master in it. So I read in an interview that you that you keep a list of, you know, things to do before I die, you know, your, your bucket list things. What is the number one thing on your bucket list? Right now? Um, oh, God, there's so many. It's really hard to pick one. Um, I would say write a book. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. Have Which you started? is... I have. It's crazy ambition. I don't even know why, but that's on there. It's one hundred things to, you know, maybe a short book. Yeah. <laughs> 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 one hundred things. Well, your book can be one hundred things to do before exactly. I die. Yeah. <laughs> and the start of it was write this book, and then you click through and the, end, the rest. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So you've got to this stage where you spent so much time in America that not only are you half American, you're actually dual dual citizenship. Um, what, what what does that make you feel like? Uh, what are your favourite things or, or your big differences between England and America? And obviously, to you know, we're filming this during the back end of lockdown in 2020. Where would you rather have been locked down? What do you think the differences are? Um, okay, to answer that question. Go. <laughs> Oh, it's a three-part question. <laughs> um, <laughs> I would say in terms of lockdown here, like I always think of myself as British first and then American second. Um, and if it came to, you know, I've spoken recently because everybody's like, you know, the election's coming up, maybe a civil war is going to break out and what's going to happen? And, you know, if you're an American, I'm like, I'm going to burn my American passport and call the British and be like, save me. Um, so I'd always say I'm British first, but it's, and then, but then I've spent the majority of my 20s in the US. So there's part of me that feels quite Americanized, which my family. Well, you did really say do. high school. I did say high you school. Did, yeah. And I sometimes say words that American, that are more American than English words. And then I get so much crap from my family. Like, oh, you yank. <laughs> Come back here, sounding all American. You're like, oh. from, from Bromley to Hollywood. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Come back. Yeah. <laughs>
Um, there was another part of the question that I didn't answer. But, what was... well, you, well, you don't have to because you clearly can't remember what okay, it was. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Where would you rather be locked down? What's... <laughs> wait, I feel like I answered that bit in England. Oh, wait. So I'd, <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather be locked down here. I think if the world... At the sanctum. At the sanctum. <laughs> in, right here in Soho. Um, in London. And I was locked down in London, which I'm happy for. Um I think when anything tragic or, you know, this happens in the world, I, I always would want to be in England. <laughs> Locked down here. <laughs> <laughs> and for for all these things that you you know that you so that you're good at and you get and you're so good at, what uh, is is there one one particular thing that you're absolutely terrible at but 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 you but you wish you could be amazing? For me, it's singing. I always wanted to be. A, I always oh, wanted to be a rock star. Same. I would love to be able to sing. <laughs> um, I I can't, and I try daily. But yeah, I'd love. I'd love to have been a singer. Well, to I'm <laughs> jumping on that one. <laughs> you can copy me. Perfect. Yeah. Well, listen, Keely, thanks a lot for being here. It's been fantastic to chat to you. Loads of great, loads of great stories and, uh, and and loads of great insight as well. I guess before you go, give yourself a shout out. Where can where can they find you? In Instagram, Twitter, YouTube. I'm on Instagram and Twitter. Um, my Instagram is my name. Keely Hazel. Twitter is Keely's Corner because somebody stole my name. So. <laughs> <laughs> and why corner? Yeah. Not your middle name. Um, it's, I st it started off I kind of as a joke that I had this corner in a house I lived in in LA and we would call it Keely's Corner and, and it kind of then just became like a thing. Like Pandora's box. Yeah, where you'd yeah. come to see what was happening in Keely's Corner. So um, right. maybe it'll change to my actual <laughs> name at one point well, if that person gives it up. Well, we've got an exclusive there. Listen, thanks yeah. a lot again. Guys, I hope you enjoyed listening to Keely as much as I enjoyed talking to her. And as always, if you like the video, press like. If you don't already subscribe, subscribe. You can see lots more great videos with people like Keely, other inspiring characters, great business leaders, etc. And if you don't listen to the audio podcast, make sure you get your skates on over to iTunes or Spotify or wherever you guys like to do your listening. And I look forward to bringing another guest to you very soon. See you later.